Good morning, and thank you for attending the Place Your Trades Network Spaces to discuss shipping. Uh, we'll be talking uh, tankers, dry bulk, and containers, and freight. Um, this Spaces is brought to you by Tradebate, which has a custom web app dedicated to trading CME Group's new daily option contracts, including indices, energy, metals, and now Bitcoin. So you can use the link in my Twitter stream to go get the Tradebate app for free. I also write a weekly blog on markets that comes out every Sunday, which is absolutely free to access. You can just go to, uh, you can find it at placeyourtrades.com. Uh, click on Shy Girl's blog and just sign up. And with that, on with the show. So first we have um, Eresh Pereira. I hope I pronounced that right. Who actually I've been Twitter friends with for like a decade, but never spoken. So Iresh is a senior executive at the commercial shipping and logistics industry for over 33 years of experience. After high school, he worked with agents for larger liner shipping companies in Sri Lanka doing vessel operations. Afterwards, still in his early 20s, he joined United Arab Shipping and worked as a risk management analyst in Dubai and Kuwait. He then moved to the commercial side of shipping in 1996. Since then, he's held various positions with liner carriers and row row carriers. He was uh, then he was then a partner in ship broking, chartering, and uh, and opening offices in Singapore, Colombo, Dubai, and London. In 2022, Iresh joined the American manufacturer Jebiel as a regional carrier manager responsible for handling logistics in the EMEA region. He holds a master's degree in finance from City University uh, and is a fellow of the Institute of Chartered Shipbrokers in the UK. Um, next, we have Craig Fuller. Craig Fuller is the founder and CEO of Freight Waves. Great, great website, by the way. Um, the leading provider of global su supply chain market intelligence and news. Prior to Freight Waves, Craig was the founder of Transcard, a major provider of fleet fuel and debit cards. He is also the CEO of Flying Magazine, the world's most widely read aviation magazine. Previously, Fuller founded Express Direct, division of U.S. Express, a leading provider of on-demand expedited truckload services. He also holds a BB. A BA from Baylor University and is a private pilot. He lives with his wife and five kids in Tennessee. And then we have uh, Ed Finley Richardson, which who he will be joining us a, a bit later. As I said, he, he's running at about 20 minutes late. He's an analyst and investor with a focus on shipping and commodities. He sees shipping as the nexus between geopolitics and international commodities trades. He runs a popular Twitter feed among uh, shipping aficionados where he shares shipping related news and research. He also tracks daily freight rates in oil tankers and dry bulk with occasional foray into offshore wind container shipping and LNG car carriers. So those are our guests today and we'll start right in. We'll start with, um, we'll start with you, Iresh, first, um, kind of give it, give us a brief, uh, overview of the state of the container market and maybe touch upon particularly as it relates to China and have we been seeing an uptick uh, in exports after the zero COVID policy went away? Hi, Tracy. Good to be here. I hope you can hear me. Is that clear now? Or? Yep, perfect. All right. So just to brief you, uh, I, honestly, it's a uh, it's a strange market to be. We had a, a massive uh, demand growth in 2020, right after COVID started. And um, as everyone knows, the the freight market went to the roof, uh, demanding rates as high as twenty thousand dollars for um, on certain routes. Um, it has come down back to earth now. Uh, we see the utilization rates remain very low in most of the routes. Um, we, we really see, we really don't see any positive catalysts uh, for the next couple of months at least. And going by what we have seen, we have seen that 
the contract rates in most of the big trade lane, major trade lanes are very, very close to the spot rates. And due to that fact, a lot of uh, beneficial cargo owners like us, are the big shippers, are holding back on uh, going for long-term contracts. Uh, that is put, putting even more demand, even more stress on the contractual rates. And we've seen rates coming down to low as $1,000 on the uh, China to U.S. West Coast uh, trade lane. A um, lot of shipping lines are trying to target around 40 to 50 percent of their business on con long term contracts, which they haven't been successful so far. Um, and if this trend continues, we, we will see further pressure on the on the container rates uh, in the coming months. And it's not been helped by the large amount of uh, uh, tonnage, which has been uh, which is in order and which is come, starting to come now into the market. And um, most likely we'll see, uh, un unless we see another supply chain side, uh, supply, supply side shock, uh, we don't see uh, rates going back up drastically. Uh, there could be um, surcharges coming in, 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 uh, in a way of, bank adjustment factors because of the oil prices. Um, alternative fuels has been introduced and uh, increases coming from that side. But on, on mainly on the freight side, we don't see anything uh, uh, dramatically changing in the next coming months. Well, that's a short brief. I can go more, more detail when we are discussing it. I have, a, and this may be a dumb question, but if rates are falling and low, why don't people want to sign long-term contracts right now? Uh, well, they think that it can go further down. I mean, try it, it's like, uh, you know, it, trying to catch a falling knife. So they they want to see where it sort of stabilizes. Every week on week, the rates are still falling. Um, the same with, uh, if you look at the uh, quarterly rates, it, it it's it, it's trending down uh, really hard. So it, it has slowed down um, slightly compared to the last quarter of last year, but rates are still falling. Uh, uh, I mean, even last week, on certain uh, certain trade rates, rate, uh, certain trade lanes rates fell as much as uh, five percent. So, I suppose everyone wants to wait and see and uh, feel where the market sort of uh, stabilizes. I guess that makes sense. Um, are you seeing any effect on from any of the Russian sanctions on the market? Uh, I mean, are uh, uh, you know like no, uh, no, as far as trade routes are concerned? No, no. Container markets, uh, Tracy. Uh, the only thing which we could see, which could come into uh, uh, sort of uh, effect, is where the bankers are concerned. I mean, you saw what happened with the OPEC uh, uh, cuts last Sunday, and those kind of things could have an effect on the freight rates where they introduce, where the carriers introduce um, additional surcharges. But on the freight side itself, freight side alone, based trade side alone, we don't see anything anything positive coming up. Okay, thank you. And um, we'll come back to you, um, Craig, I want to bring Craig up. Um, so, you know, uh, uh, 2020 and 2021, kind of into 2022, it was all about supply chain crisis, right? So, um, can you talk about a little bit about what is the state of the quote unquote supply chain crisis right now? And um, is supply chain inflation behind us? Yeah, it's a great question. I think this gets uh, asked a lot. So there's really a couple of things that drove supply chain inflation. One is we effectively shut down the economy in 2020. At the same time, the Federal Reserve was flooding and all governments around the world were flooding the economy full of all this liquidity which just caused a massive bottleneck. Um, transportation assets, transportation markets are capacity constrained. And that means that effectively um, the way the transportation providers will invest in their assets is based on current demand. Uh, what, what happened is there was so much demand flowing through the economy and there were so many bottlenecks. It was effectively the way to think of it as like a denial service attack is so much stuff was moving through these really uh, tight bottlenecks. Uh, and that created a massive backlog in the supply chain. Well, we're now through all of that. And we have the opposite uh, issue, which is we now have an overabundance of capacity. 
uh, in the transportation and logistics networks. So over the past uh, couple of years, because of really high demand and really high rates is the transportation providers and logistics providers went out and invested substantial amount of uh, money in their infrastructure and in their human capital uh, that has oversupplied the market full of capacity. So you see it on the ocean side, you know, the order books for new uh, ocean uh, container vessels is is exceptionally high. The, you know, this will be the largest over the next two years, the largest amount of vessel capacity put into the market in history at a time when rates are depressed. In trucking, uh, just from 2018 to where we're at today, uh, capacity has increased in terms of dispatchable. This is from the Federal Motor Care uh, FS, FMCSA data. Uh, the number of dispatchable trucks or trucks that are in the for hire trucking market is up 29% in five years. And the volume of freight transactions today is approximately at the same level as it was in 2018. So we have a situation where there is so much capacity in the market. There is so much available transportation infrastructure that's, that's available for shippers to be able to utilize that, frankly, uh, the market is incredibly oversupplied. And so all of the supply chain inflation that we've seen is at least relates to logistics uh, is largely a function of the past. And we think it's going to take a couple of years to really clear up a lot of that uh, excess uh, across the market. It will take longer, frankly, for the ocean carriers to do that because they uh, their, their cycles are, are just take a lot longer to reset. There's a lot of barriers to entry uh, for the ocean container market. And because of that, uh, and these the capex that goes into a ship, uh, uh, is just so much longer, the depreciation cycle is longer, that frankly, uh, it will take longer to sort of reset that market. And then if you sort of buy into the thesis that globalization has sort of peaked and we're sort of in a situation where the market's going to be more fragmented, it will favor, frankly, smaller ships. And so we're in a situation where the ocean freight market has peaked. Uh, we're unlikely to see those levels anytime, uh, probably in my lifetime. Uh, and we're also in a situation where trucking capacity has been immensely oversupplied over the last couple of years. And it's going to take a while to, to really get those excesses out of the system. And I, I talked to Eresha a little bit about this in China. Can you, uh, I mean, so China's reopened now. There's lots of talk about a resurgence in exports. Are we seeing this at uh, U.S. ports now? And, uh, and what does that mean for, say, the trucking industry? Yeah, no, it actually, so we saw the collapse in ocean container volumes started actually at the end of May. It was May 24th. From May 24th to June 6th, we saw a 30% drawdown in what we call bookings, which are bookings are, are basically when, when, a, um, when you're going to be booked a container onto a ship, uh, you go through these software systems and platforms that you book it. And so it typically has about an eight, the 12 day lead before you actually put the container on the ship. The advantage of that is you're actually seeing the containers be booked into the software platforms so that they can be basically scheduled to go out on that ship. And then you have the transit time into the United States and North America, that, you know, in a normal cycle can be two to three weeks, but last year was as much as 10 to 12 weeks because these massive backlogs. So we saw a collapse in ocean volume that coincided with the reopening of China. So when China had its sort of first reopening after that sort of first major lockdown that took place last year, we saw a collapse in bookings. And it really was sort of breathtaking because you expected this quote unquote tsunami of containers that were supposed to flow over from China into the United States. It just didn't happen. And since then, we've seen the market continue to just, you know, it, it sort of bottomed out uh, through uh, the new year and sort of like trickled back up, we're still at very anemic low levels. And at the ports, you know, we're we're at very low levels relative to where it had been in the past couple of years. And that, of course, is going to impact trucking demand uh, and intermodal rail demand because there isn't a lot of imports. Now, one thing I would say is this is the part that oftentimes gets missed or confused about how freight works is freight is a very unique commodity in the sense that because you cannot store it, people do not, just because rates are low, people do not go buy freight 
capacity. They're not buying demand when freight is low. And what I mean by that is I can go store oil or I can go store lumber or I can go store still and warehouse it. Yes, there's a cost to that, but I can speculate in the physical market. In the freight market, you can't do that. I cannot buy freight capacity. It's perishable uh, and therefore I can't sit on it. And the only reason that companies transport goods from one point to another point or point A to point B to this destination is because there's a receiver, there's demand on the other side. So the reason China is really anemic and exports are anemic is entirely to do with the case that U.S. consumers and really global consumers, but certainly U.S. consumers, just aren't buying as much product and physical goods. And retailers are reluctant to stock up and rebuild those inventories because they just don't have the demand or they don't have the expectation of more demand. So that is what's driving anemic exports. And there's not a lot that the Chinese government can do for that, except just continue to flood their economy full of you know what resources and money they have. But they can't force consumers in the United States to buy things. Um, and so it really is a situation where it suggests that the U.S. consumer sort of tapped out. And uh, we certainly don't think we'll, that that demand will re- return at any level uh, uh, to what we've seen the last couple of years. So does that mean pretty much that I was that was pretty much my next question. But if you can just uh expand on this a little bit. So does that mean that, you know, I know that at one point we had a backlog of. Uh, of goods because uh, people were importing so much. So does that mean that, uh, you know, retailers, et cetera, have kind of, they've already gone through their backlog of uh, stock and just waiting for the consumer? No, I think they still, there's some excesses, you know, it's pockets of excess. And this is the whole thing about there have been quote unquote recessions that have happened in different markets the auto market has been fairly robust due to the lack of auto production over the last couple of years. The auto markets, there has been, you know, there's still challenge to get certain types of makes and models of cars and autos into the market. So you're still seeing inventory tightness in there that's sort of exacerbating some of the other issues that are a part of that. But if you look at a general sort of sense, and it's really product specific, you know, apparel uh, is is largely sort of, you know, it's easy for the retailers to sort of burn off that apparel. That's why TJ Maxx, uh, Ross stores, and some of these discounters have done exceptionally well because they've gotten their hands on some really high quality goods and name brand items that they've been able to liquidate. So it just depends on the inventory and the items specifically. Some of the higher dollar discretionary goods, like appliances and TVs, um, it just take a lot longer for retailers to sort of burn off that inventory. Uh, and they will sit on it. If you've got an item that costs a thousand dollars, they're more likely to sit on those items and just wait for consumer demand than they are to liquidate it. So it all it's all a category specific question more so. But we are not seeing any signs that retailers themselves are uh, adding demand or certainly pulling on the economy of the supply chain to move products in. They're certainly not importing it. And the thing to keep in mind is that when we talk container market specifically. 75% of the goods that flow through containers are retail and consumer related. So really, when we're talking about containers specifically, what we're really talking about is the consumer uh, the retail market. And we're not seeing any signs of a surge in demand um, that would suggest that retailers do not have confidence uh, such to, to add inventory to their warehouses. Thank you. Yeah, yeah, it makes sense that 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 this pretty that it is industry specific. And there's one more point um, um, that I'll make is that this is not exclusive to trucking. So we actually track the corrugated box manufacturers and packaging materials, and they are their data is identical to what we're seeing. We're seeing freight demand that matches 2018. It's exactly there was a survey done last week. And that's exactly what the survey says is that that corrugated box demand and packaging material demand is equal to 2018 levels. So we, we believe that this is not just a trucking phenomenon, but it is really a macroeconomic phenomenon related to the U.S. consumer. That's good. That's, uh, watch the boxing mar- box market, kids. That's very yeah. good advice. <laughs> Crazy, Crazy, uh, Crazy Drive, you born, what Craig mentioned. Uh, yeah, go. U.S. retail invent- investors' inventories, not even inventories, were still about, 13% higher than 2019 level. So, and if you if you look at the top 20 large listed retailers, 
their inventories are about 37 percent higher than the 2019 levels. So um, the inventories are still very high, and there seems to be uh, loss of a uh, less of a drawdown on on that side of the business. Uh, so demand is really not there um, on on the US side. Um, there is one pocket of one lane which is doing really well, which is the Europe to the US lane. Uh, both on the ocean and the air markets, uh, those two lanes are doing really well. And you could still see the uh, the rates, uh, especially on the air side, holding really well on Europe to US as well as the the transatlantic um, ocean ocean uh, trade lane. Um, so those are the two, only two positive uh, uh, lanes from which we could see that there there could be some uh, improvement in the coming months. And, um, and since we're talking about that, how are the bulk markets performing, Irish? Uh, the bulk markets that- market, two months of good run in February and March. Um, the the markets uh, sort of collapsed uh, last year, three months before uh, the container market uh, started moving down. Um, but the last two months, purely, purely due to the steel demand in China, the markets have uh, gone up about 150, 160 percent. But it's coming from a very low point. So um, we are not. Con- well, I'm, I'm not in right back now. But uh, the what we hear from all the ship brokers and the charters are that they are not confident that this is a, uh, a real turn in the market itself. It could be a, um, a seasonal. Uh, change in the trend of the dry bulk market. Excellent. Thank you. Um, and then also, um, but for, you know, we talked about, remember IMO 2020 and that kind of fizzled out. Everybody thought it was going to completely throw the market in a tizzy and it didn't. Um, so what does this mean for, I know they're changing some rules um, in 2023. So what is that? What will that mean for for the market? So the, the potential upside for the carriers is that um, there could be the old vessels could go on detention if they're not, uh, uh, they're not in compliance with the regulation. That's one. And then the capacity could be reduced due to speed, uh, uh, speed restraints. Um, and this could create a sort of a disparity in the transit types on certain routes, which would again lead to a um, lot of, uh, how would I say, um, disruption in services. So that, that's a positive, uh, it could be a positive side for all the uh, carriers in the 2024 onwards because their, their demolition markets are also starting to um, sort of, well, starting to do well. And perhaps if the older tonnage gets out of the market, that uh, excess capacity could be reduced uh, from that side as well. Well, if they slow down the speed of these boats, wouldn't that mean this is going to take them longer? So they get so they, paid more? <laughs> well, that would work more or less in, in what they are doing now, right now to manage the capacities by canceling uh, calls. Um, it, it would just uh, mean that they would have to, um, how would I say, uh, put more capacity out in the market and that then sort of create a um, less supply and uh, get the get get the carry, get the shippers to sort of work with them on more long term contracts. That makes sense. Sorry, I forgot to unmute myself. Craig, did you have any thoughts on this, on the IMO stuff? Yeah, I mean, like, I, I think you're right. Everybody sort of expected this massive sort of change in, um, you know, surge in diesel prices uh, that was going to impact not just the ocean market, but, but the trucking as well. It just didn't happen. Now, it coincided with uh, COVID. Um, and so if you think about when it went into effect and when it was actually going to be sort of force implemented uh, and how the sort of the the freight calendar works um we just didn't see the impact of imo uh because covid really sort of destroyed a lot of that sort of near-term diesel demand um and you know a lot of the sort of 
refiners and and folks that supply to that market, as well as the carriers have have sort of retrofitted through scrubbers and have looked at other solutions. Um, and so the market has sort of adapted. I think it got a sort of a maybe a 12 month to 24 month sort of reprieve, uh, but it certainly has not uh, impacted from what I can tell. And I like, you know, energy markets is not my specialty, but we certainly look at the residual of what uh, IMO was sort of expected to do. And I think even we had sort of expected it to, to really crunch U.S. diesel supplies or for ultra low diesel and it just didn't. And well, and then speaking of diesel, um, you know, we had you know, for a couple of years there, we were seeing a big diesel problem uh, in the U.S. or lack thereof, I should say. Um, and it was also in Europe as well. It's sort of a global phenomenon um, with less trucking demand. Do you think that will alleviate that so we don't see that this Spring. Yeah, I mean, diesel, if you look at the year over year numbers is down anywhere from eight to 10%. And most of that is US highway diesel. And so you certainly are seeing a situation where uh, the trucking, the slowness and the slowdown and the contraction in freight demand is, is, is a drag on diesel demand. And that as tight as supplies got last year, particularly as we sort of looked at the summer and the fall, um, sort of moving into the fall, that that is a positive development, because you know, at one point, the diesel supply was so tight that there was a lot of concern uh, about just not having enough to supply the U.S. transportation system and infrastructure. And if you want to see economy grind to a halt and really put, you know, not just the economy, but also the livelihood of our country at stake, you know, cut off the diesel supply. So it was a pretty frightening moment at, at one point last year to, to getting refined diesel into the market. The market was able to adapt it, but it got so tight that it was concerning. So in some ways, having slower trucking demand and freight demand sort of relieves a lot of that pressure on diesel at least short term. I think there's a lot of questions about what happens over the long term just because refinery capacities uh, just, you know, isn't there and new refiners aren't coming online. But I think as it looks right now, uh, you know, it's a sort of a short term positive development. Thank you. Thank you. That's a good. Well, that's good news for uh, for diesel prices, right? Um, lower diesel prices. Uh, Edward, unless you sell diesel. I lower yeah. diesel prices. Yes. True, true, true. That's that's true. We are seeing, already seeing an uptake. Uh, you know, we have gasoline supplies. They're lowest in a very long time. So uh, we are seeing an uptick in prices, diesel and gasoline. But Ed has joined us. Yay. So um, I did already introduce you. And so uh, <laughs> go right in. Um, I know that with this, um, obviously with this OPEC cuts, everybody wants to talk tankers and what this means for the tanker market. So can you kind of uh, talk to us a little bit about that? And um, perhaps also um, how, how this compares to the product tanker market. Yeah, sure. Uh, thanks for the invitation to participate. Uh, I guess it's uh, it's very interesting to see how people react both from within the shipping market and then also from the outside, because I think that people love to look uh, to shipping for kind of like um, indicators for what might happen next in macro. And on the other hand, people in the shipping markets are always looking from the outside at the macro markets to see what might be coming down the pike. So I think that the first immediate reaction uh, was disappointment. And I think this is just one of those things which you know is always a risk with OPEC, even if it's gonna, you know, whether it's gonna be a surprise or whether it's gonna be at one of their planned meetings that they might cut the volumes. And so the kind of the knee jerk reaction is that it's a negative for in particular the crude tanker markets. And I think that, um, you know, when we heard the news, all of us knew that the stocks were gonna get destroyed the next day. So that wasn't really that surprising. Uh, I think that the timing of it just happened to coincide with sentiment softening on one of the vessel classes, which is one of the most popular to uh, use as a macro indicator, the VLCC market, which is, of course, what other people call the super tankers. They, have, they can transport 2 million barrels per day. So I guess the immediate uh, repercussion is that uh, Saudi Arabia, um, UAE, the Emirates are going to be shipping less cargoes east now that sets off a number of a kind of a, an interesting game theory situation. 
um, because you know you can argue about what the goal was there, whether it was to support the price, um, but certainly the customers of Middle Eastern oil are not going to be happy. And of course, two of the biggest customers and the biggest consumers of crude oil refining it and then sending it out back in the world, China and India, they just happen to have a wonderful new provider, Russia, who is very happy to send them millions of barrels per day and at a discount. So this is a really tricky situation for the Middle East. And I think that you know the, the immediate consequences are that China might want to source their oil elsewhere. Um, China tends to be pretty agnostic about where they source their oil from. I have a really great chart. Um, you know, their customs data is uh, more or less reliable. Uh, for example, they often tend to pretend that uh, crude oil, which is actually coming from Iran, is coming from Oman or some other places or from Iraq. Um, but one of the things which becomes clear if you track where they're getting their cargoes from is that they just import from everywhere, basically. And they like to show the market that if prices become too high somewhere, they can just pivot to another provider. So at the moment, I think one of the things which we want to know, understand is whether uh, the fact that Saudi is um, going to be restricting their supply means that Ch um, China will just pivot to West Africa or to America or to Brazil. And if you look at a map, you'll realize very quickly that any of those places is farther away than the Middle East to China, which is actually a pretty short voyage. The same is true for the Middle East to India. Uh, you can track these cargoes on various websites and you know, Saudi Arabia to West India is just a very short voyage. And so if they start to source their, their barrels from elsewhere, that's gonna be higher utilization, which is in turn going to learn to a tighter market in vessels now. I'm not talking about oil itself, but about vessels. And that's going to learn, lead to higher rates. And so that's kind of like an interesting second order effect. But the market, you know, tends to just kind of have the knee jerk reaction of the first, um, you know, the, the, the immediate effect without thinking it through. So I think that now those of us who are within shipping are have figured this out. In fact, we, you know, some of us had figured it out within a few hours and we were exchanging on Twitter. And that's one of the, the wonderful things about the hive mind of ship twit is you can have these discussions and work out, OK, so. If China isn't happy about the price of Saudi oil now, where are they going to go for the discounted oil? Or where else are their alternatives? And of course, they have so much leverage in this relationship with Russia now. Um, you know, Russia is obviously happy now that um, crude oil, the, the perception is that the crude oil supply will be diminished, which hopefully will put a floor under their, their oil. And, and they're hoping that they can reduce the discount, which they've had to initiate in order to make up for these long, long voyages going all the way around the Iberian Peninsula, through the Mediterranean, through the Suez Canal, uh, by Yemen, you know, getting to India or to China before they were just shipping to Rotterdam. So um, someone has to pay for that, and it's Russia uh, more often than not, either by buying secondhand vessels or in practice just selling on a delivered basis. So that's the crude market. I would say that the crude market, it's, it's going to be largely a positive, but it's going to take some time. Now, for traders, this is really positive because the market's panicking right now and it's selling off these stocks. Um, freight rates have remained largely uh, stable, in particular in the Suez Max and Aftermax uh, rates. They've, they've softened a little bit, but not much. They've been strong all year, frankly. Now, VLCC is a little bit different because rates were already softening off of a peak of over $100,000 a day, and um, charterers were already gaining the upper hand. And then these cuts were announced about a week into a rally that was faltering. So that was really sentiment wise, it was really handy for those charterers, you know, the big oil companies or the refineries order ordering these barrels. So we've seen VLCCs come off a lot, but I think that it's a great buying opportunity for those who are interested and who are following the market closely enough. Now for product tankers, it's a little bit more tricky because having less barrels per se doesn't necessarily impact demand for uh, distillates, for jet fuel, for NAFTA, for um, fuel oil even. That's kind of a, you know, it's, it's a separate thing. I think a lot of people get confused about this. And I can tell when um, people who are like fund managers or family office traders, you know, they, they, they follow the tanker market, but they, the, the kind of the distinction between the product tanker market and the crew tanker market, people just kind of lump them together. And I think that's a really dangerous thing to do if you're investing in these markets. You really have to separate them out. Um, so just you know, to, as a reminder, uh, 
the, who, the people who are interested in importing crude oil are not the end consumers, it's the refineries, right? So you have to know whether refineries are motivated and have the capacity to ramp up utilization. It's, I mean, it's, it's, it's something very obvious for those of us who, who follow the oil market, but I think a lot of people just don't even realize that. And so, uh, of course, the irony with the oil market is that um, the source of oil, you know, the, the producers, they have to send, they have to ship the oil very, like halfway around the world, basically, to get to refineries. And it's just super inefficient. And it's been that way for years, and it's getting worse. So for product tankers, it's not necessarily a negative. In fact, um, the, the medium range tankers, the smaller ones, uh, which are largely regional trades. So for example, from the Baltics down to the Mediterranean or intra-Asian trades. So for example, from China to South Korea or Singapore to South Korea. Um, these ha have actually been firming a lot recently and that coincides with following inventories pretty much everywhere of distillates. I mean, now we just saw some pretty dramatic numbers uh, in the U.S., but that 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 kind of um, is consistent with with falling inventories we've seen all over the place. So um, it's been a very interesting time for tankers because it seems like supply was already tightening, and also, of course, um, inventories seem to already be tightening. And so, for OPEC to to take the initiative here and to jolt the market like this is it's a little bit strange. I don't. That's one of the reasons why we weren't expecting it. It's because those of us who follow this markets. We're already seeing things move in the right direction. And so um, it strikes me as a little bit kind of like market manipulation for whatever reason. And so therefore that could lead to some to some weird consequences that that aren't necessarily positive for either freight or or the oil markets because there can be kind of like a negative reaction. I mean, I think one of the things that many of us were wondering when we saw this surprise cut is, you know, okay, so the first thing is you're skeptical because um, as soon as Europe stopped importing Russian oil and distillates, everyone was panicking, saying the Russians are going to lose supply, the Russians are going to lose supply over the winter, the permafrost is going to come. And, the, and of course, the exact opposite has happened. They flooded the market with supply, both ahead of uh, the price cap or the embargo, but also just in general, clearly supply is not the problem. And so I think that when OPEC decided to proactively make this cut, it kind of makes you wonder whether that says something about the demand side, whether it's weaker than it seems whether they want to leave more of a margin of error in case they need extra supply, but they can't ramp it online. So um, I guess to, to come back to the original question, yeah, the knee-jerk reaction was negative because seaborne volumes being reduced is never a good thing for tanker owners. You always want lots of people uh, asking for tanker to come and transport your oil. So it's it's a little bit like if you're in a big city and you're ordering an Uber and it starts raining and then what happens? You have surge pricing, right? So if the surge pricing disappears, that's kind of a sign that the rain stopped and there's no longer a crisis. And so I that that was a little bit off-putting to me, you know, that's this announcement. I thought it would have been better to just let the, the market do its job. So um, from everything I follow, and I think that people who, who follow my feed carefully, they know that I'm, I'm sharing freight rates on a daily basis. Also, the futures market gives you some insight into sentiment because the people trading those are often involved in the markets and they see what's coming in the next few days. But it's it's actually really hard to find a vessel class in tankers right now, whether it's crude or product, which isn't wildly profitable. So, um, you know, it's transforming the balance sheets of the companies. The strong market has lasted most of 2022 after one of the worst years, 2021 in recent memory. So, you know, we're seeing loan to value um, ratios of these companies go from like 50% to 30 or in some cases in the 20s in just one year. So that implies that they're going to start returning capital to shareholders because they can't get vessels in time to take advantage of this bull market. The Korean shipyards are full. Uh, you can't get a tanker for another, you know, two years or more. So it's pretty exciting. Um, but yeah, I think it's, I guess to close, I would say that it's it's very tricky if you are um, watching from the outside to use tankers as an indication of demand. This is something a lot of people um, who play oil futures or invest in producers, you know, they, they wanted, they contacted me via DM to learn more about volumes being shipped and everything. But the thing is you have to remember is the positioning of the vessels has a, a lot to do with the freight rates. And so if if freight rates are spiking, yes, it's an indicator that there's demand, that the two tend to be 
correlated, but it's not really that simple. There's a lot of other things going on. If a tanker is in the wrong place, you know, if it's halfway around the world and it has to come to pick up the cargo, that's going to mean that the tanker is going to be busy. You know, it's ballasting for a long time. And that may lead to a tightening of vessel supply. So it's not just like, you can't just see that tanker rates are going up and say, oh, um, you know, uh, oil demand is, is really is really high. It's, it's not that simple, unfortunately. It's just, you know, it's, it's much more subtle, nuanced picture, if that makes sense. Absolutely. And I wanted to ask when you, uh, before you were in, we kind of, we were talking about IMO uh, 2020 and 2023. Um, how do you see IMO 2023 rules affecting uh, these, the, the tanker markets? I mean, look, in theory, if we didn't have these huge disruptions, it would be affecting things in the margin. Uh, I think it's important to keep in mind that the fact that, you know, we have constrained supply is one thing and we don't have a lot of new deliveries coming. But 2021 was just horrible. And it wasn't just because China was in lockdowns. I mean, you know, the, the, the market was more balanced than I think a lot of people were willing to admit. And I'll never forget listening to some of the, the earnings calls just after the Russian invasion of Ukraine. There were some Q1 calls. And people were saying, no, no, the rates aren't going up because of, this, of the war. It's because of the supply picture, because there's not that many vessels. And I, and I think a lot of us were just chuckling listening to those calls because it was obvious that that wasn't it. So with IMO and um, you know the other regulations, which will eventually be um, headwinds for the ability for tankers to travel quickly enough or to have um, you know environmental re- uh, ratings, which will allow them to um, have oil majors as clients, I think that's going to be helpful. But the disruptions that we're witnessing now, uh, whether it's the war, which you know may be spreading soon, who knows? Um, whether it's the fact that the oil market has now de facto been partitioned into, let's say, pariah states or the East or BRICS or whatever you want to call it, and the West. I mean, these are disrupting things so much more than something like IMO. I mean, IMO is kind of a joke. You know, it, it would have maybe changed things utilization or efficiency by half a percent or one percent, but I mean, compared to a cargo which is going instead from from Primorsk to Rotterdam, going all the way to China, and then another cargo replacing that demand in Rotterdam from let's say Brazil, it's like it's just they're they're not comparable. If that makes sense, I mean, the disruptions that we're witnessing are just they're insane. I mean, they're so they're not subtle. Whereas I think with IMO, you know, these 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 environmental organizations, they're always trying to phase things in very slowly. And I think there's been a lot of disappointment um, from people that they haven't been clear. And that has also turned into a tailwind for owners because everyone's terrified of, of ordering new vessels because they don't know what proportional system to order. They're not going to, they don't know if they're going to be penalized. Um, you know, Maersk has taken the lead with all these methanol um, ships, ships that run on methanol. And so they have to worry about having the fuel for those tankers and kind of creating uh, bunker hubs and making sure that the, the ethanol or whatever is available. But I think most people are just not even bothering ordering. No one wants to be first in ordering. And I think that's that's normal. If you look at it from a game theory perspective, you, you're not the winner if you're the first one ordering and you order the wrong kind of vessel. So in other words, uh, to, to sum up, without getting into the minutia of, of, um, of, of the IMO regulations, I think they've just, they've, they've, they haven't had an effect really. I mean, they've just been, they've been completely sidelined by reality, by geopolitics, by all these other things. I mean, the numbers of changes that we're seeing of vesselization due to these disruptions are, are, I mean, they're, they're not normal. You know, this is, this is the kind of thing which is supposed to maybe last a few weeks, a month. Um, You know, oil markets are very efficient. Uh, There are a lot of people who, uh, can make a lot of money if they find ways to get rid of inefficiencies. I mean, I'll, I'll give you a very simple example. Uh, there was some crude oil which was being taken from Primorsk to, to China and um, on these older tankers and they used to be earning rates which were 1.5 to two times uh, regular rates, sometimes more. But, and now those fees have gone down and that's because the market has found players who have purchased tankers and who were willing to ship it for less. And so, you know, they're still gaining fantastic premiums. If you look at the tanker rates, I mean, I've shared some of these by a, a, a cool uh, ship broker, Infinity in Norway. 
And they, they actually, they publish the rates from, which include kind of Russian distillates to the Mediterranean, for example. And we're still talking, you know, $150,000 a day for these small vessels and these small cargoers. And you wonder who's paying this money. But these rates are already down from the peaks. And so, you know, the market will do its job and um, these rates will tend to come down. But I think that from an investment perspective, even if you think that the peak is behind us in terms of the rates that people are willing to pay to transport Russian oil or distillates, I mean, the companies have already been transformed. So like it's pretty much just a cherry on top, anything from this point forward. And, and what, um, if, what if any, um, you know, Russia now has been, you know, buying their own fleet, right, to get around sanctions. Has, how has this affected the market, if any? Well, I mean, the whole thing has been a real fiasco because uh, those of us who've been following the, you know, the market the whole time know that in May, uh, Russia's biggest state-owned uh, shipping company, Sovkomflot, which is a listed company, um, they had a fire sale of their tankers. I mean, they just needed the revenue. They needed the money. They were desperate. And then a few months later, they were back in the market um, <laughs> buying them, you know, listed on these... Um, Shape broker weekly reports as undisclosed buyers. So some of them went and incorporated in places like Dubai um, or Turkey, and they set up basically front companies, which is the way that Iran got around the sanctions. So um, it's been really a big deal for every owner because it's put a floor under these secondhand assets. And the irony of the whole thing is that Russia has gone after the least attractive assets. So these, these tankers that are over 15 years old, um, you have to pay special, what's called a special survey, which is basically, it's, it's kind of like, you know, a checkup for your car. <laughs> I mean, it's, it's maintenance and the maintenance gets more expensive the older the tanker is. And so no one wants to buy a tanker, which is older, over 15 years old. These are assets which are really unattractive, but Russia and its allies have been bidding these old tankers up. And so it's become this really distorted, um, you know, it's as if, uh, a Honda Civic, you know, a diesel Honda Civic from 20 years ago would appreciate, you know, would double in value, whereas a new BMW would be depreciating. It's That's the kind of thing that we're seeing in the tanker, tanker markets. So the, the companies which had the least attractive assets, um, their net asset value has skyrocketed over the past six months. I mean, one obvious one to think of is TK tankers. Um, you know, they are... In normal circumstances, they would be in desperate need of fleet renewal. Another one is International Seaways. You know, these they uh, merged with um, Diamond Shipping a couple of years ago, and they acquired all these really old clunkers. But these are the assets which have appreciated the most. And so, anyone who's bought a tanker, which you know, even under poor circumstances in the last two years, has already doubled their money because these old assets have been bid up. So. I think that's really distorted the market. It doesn't seem to be ending anytime soon. I think a lot of us um, were kind of watching carefully when the embargo and the price cap came into force. We thought they'd be done buying by then. But it, um, from, from what I can tell, they're certainly not done buying. I mean, we are way above even last year's numbers for MR takers, the smaller ones, which are carrying um, distillates, small distances. So there's clearly a lot of people who want to get in on this trade. Um, and again, they're still buying the oldest ones. So, I mean, presumably they're not complying with um, regulations which allow them to access Western insurance companies, but also just as clearly they don't, <laughs> they don't care because they don't have to. They're playing by their own rules. Now that creates a very high risk situation in terms of the environment because who are these crews? You know, who is doing the ship to ship transfers at midnight off the coast of West Africa? Do these people know what they're doing? What happens if there's a storm? What if there's an oil spill? Who's going to pay for it if they're not insured? I mean, it raises a lot of really problematic um, issues, but the reality is it's happening. So um, it seems like asset values are going up. And I'm hearing rumors now that Russians are also looking to acquire a lot of dry bulk vessels, which has not been as big of a deal um, in terms of a disruption and also in terms of appreciation of assets since the beginning. And you know, that indicates two things as far as I'm concerned. The first is that it indicates that Russia has no intention of um, changing course anytime soon from a geopolitical perspective. And they're going all in and they want to control their supply chains. They want to, they want to control their 
their possibilities to distribute grain, which is a huge important export for them. And I expect them to do the same thing with uh, LNG vessels too, when the time comes next, you know, ahead of next winter. So I think the tanker story might just be part of the equation. It might just, in other words, some of us think, you know, we were maybe wary that it might be the end of the story, but it, in, it might just be the beginning of secondhand vessels um, appreciating in value based on this completely artificial scenario. But um, yeah, it's, it's kind of astonishing to watch. It's incredible, incredible. Um, Arash, are you, do you have any insights on this um, or any thoughts on, you know, these uh, Rush kind of buying their own fleets? <laughs> well, to be honest, Tracy, I, I'm more concerned on the container side. And um, I, ke I keep um, sort of a look at uh, something very um, uh, special on the, which is called the, the average quarterly revenue per TU. For, for most of the carriers, it was between thousand five hundred to two thousand uh, dollars beginning uh, first quarter of two thousand twenty one. It went up to uh, three thousand five, so been almost more than doubled up to three thousand five hundred to four thousand in um, last quarter of twenty one and first quarter of twenty two, and it's now heading south fast and very close to coming back to about thousand five hundred dollars. Um, so, uh, keeping that in mind and looking at uh, ocean carriers had a very good run for the two years. I mean, I saw somewhere someone saying that um, they, their revenue uh, for the three years was more than combined 63 years of container shipping history. Um, so they have a lot of cushioning effect. They can they can uh, run a couple of quarters uh, with less revenue. They're still making a lot of money. Um, I saw John from Blue Capital saying that they're estimating about $43 billion of revenue this year. Um, but if, if from an equity point of view, if I have to be, if someone wants to be long uh, listed container carriers, they have to be very brave. Personally, I don't feel comfortable. Um, and if there's still, if still someone is interested in looking at um, equity investing on the shipping side, they have looked at container carriers uh, where they have diversified. A lot of container carriers went and bought freight forwarders, uh, road haulage companies, and a lot of non-direct uh, ocean shipping interests. So those are the carriers to focus on. Um, and, the, and, the, and the other thing is that um, we have seen this boom and bust cycles over, over the last 40, 50 years. Uh, uh, it's a 10 to 12 year cycle. Uh, the only difference this time is that they made so much of money. So they could even for a year or two, they can run with a, uh, uh, even if they have to go to a negative p &L, they, they they still have enough money to cushion that effect. Um, or the risk to the upside for them is that they, if the spot market turns for some reason or the other, uh, that's a good thing for the container carriers. Um, also, as I mentioned earlier, lower speed due to IMO 23. Those things are the positive things. Only only downside risk for them is that if there is a change in the uh, global trade and macro headwinds for the uh, the, the the growth, uh, and then if and U.S. China trade tensions escalate, those those things could affect them. But other than that, I'm I'm um, I'm cautious about investing in the container market as of now. Well, thank you. Craig, moving on to you, uh, can you talk to us about, we talk uh, a lot about uh, reshoring and nearshoring, particularly in the U.S., especially um, with this new uh, Inflation Act, I mean, Inflation Reduction Act. Um, so <laughs> is that happening? Um, is it a pot, you know, is it is it going to happen? Is it a possibility? Are there hurdles? If so, you know, what's involved with that? Yeah, I mean, if you look, it is happening. There is certainly a movement of supply chains moving to other countries. You know, we had a problem with high concentration of a lot of our supply chain dependencies were on China and that whole, you know, that whole region. And we're seeing a, a disbursement of supply chains to places like Vietnam and India uh, and uh, even to places like Colombia and Mexico. And so we're seeing 
you know, if you look at the freight market, and we, we tr track the trucking market specifically by uh, individual markets in the United States, what's really interesting about this is the markets in the United States that are seeing growth as it relates to trucking volume, almost every market in the United States over the past uh, year has actually shrunk in size in terms of market share and is actually seeing lower freight volume, particularly the big port cities like you know, Southern California and LA have seen uh, just been capitulated. But what we are seeing is places, uh, the three biggest markets, highest growth markets in the United States that are actually increasing in volume. One is Detroit and that's all auto. The other is Houston. Uh, and the third is Laredo, Texas. And what I think is really interesting about that, Houston's probably as much as, you know, so you got some energy and chemicals and petrochemicals that sort of have been have been pretty robust in terms of demand. Uh, but you also have a lot of import activities, uh, activity happening at the Port of Houston, and you have a lot of truck activity happening uh, in Laredo. And so we're seeing uh, the movement of supply chains back to the Americas. And I think you have to include South America in that, particularly Colombia, as part of that equation. And I think what supply chain companies have recognized or companies that have, you know, are dependent upon their supply chain to run their business, whether we're talking retailers or, or manufacturers, have realized that concentration uh, in a geopolitically contested region like China uh, has, has exposed them significantly to not only um, governments that had made decisions that uh, are not sort of favorable to their business and can really impact dramatically impact their business, but also geopolitical tensions. And I think it's anyone's guess on whether, you know, the United States and China at some point end up in a hot conflict related to Taiwan. Uh, you can make the case either way. Uh, if that were to happen, then it would, you know, really significantly impact um, supply chains that are dependent upon China. And that's why companies like Apple have started to really move out of the country or try to disperse their their supply chain dependencies out of China. And so because of all that, I think companies are putting a priority on moving uh, their supply chains back to the Americas. We do a lot of what we call site selection studies, which is advise, you know, half of the cost of running the supply chain is the transportation itself. So a lot of people think about the physical plant to put in a warehouse and you have labor, but half of the actual supply chain cost is, is the cost of moving products. Um, and if you think about that, then transportation is an enormously important factor in where they actually put the warehouses and distribution centers and even manufacturing plants. And so we do a lot of what we call site selections, which was we evaluate what it actually costs uh, to run that supply chain or that warehouse once it's, once it's put into place based on geography and where they plan on shipping. We're doing a lot more of those types of studies than we've ever done. And the intentions are very real. When Donald Trump said he was going to basically cut off China uh, through his trade war, there was sort of a lot of people sort of looked at that as a tax, but there was no real movement uh, in terms of everyone sort of looked at it as hyperbole and typical Donald Trump sort of making these big threats, um, sort of the art of negotiation. But I think what is real now is those the substantive changes in how companies treat their supply chains, the risks associated with them, and really the unpredictability of foreign governments and the fact that they are willing to sort of give up their economic well-being and sort of their market responses to, to really sort of implement their policies means that we're dealing with a different world. I think supply chain uh, professionals are taking that into taking that as a very serious uh, uh, sort of initiative and, and, and looking at moving their supply chains back. And, and the data is reflecting that. Like I said, Laredo is now one of the biggest growth markets in the United States in terms of freight demand. Uh, and it's certainly taking uh, more market share from other markets. So let me ask, we're coming up on the hour that went past. Um, we'll probably go Tracy, over a little bit, but... Um, Tracy, I, I have to interrupt you. I just ask one question from Craig before we run we, we will run out of time. Uh, Craig, this is for you. Um, I mean, ocean carriers enjoyed uh, exemptions to federal antitrust laws since Shipping Act came in 1916. And... You saw Jim Costa trying to introduce the Ocean Shipping Antitrust Enforcement Act and the, the shipping carriers opposing it. How do you see that happening in the U.S., uh, Craig? Yeah, I mean, like, it's hard to predict a government agreeing on anything. Um, but I, I do think there is a lot of argument. I mean, if you look at the concentration of the ocean carriers, they have more market power than uh, OPEC has over the oil markets. I mean, if you look yeah. at the, the top 10 carriers, they have 90% market share. And whether or not the, the price 
what we saw over the past 24 months is price manipulation or coercion. It, it doesn't matter at the end of the day. The optics are there. Uh, the Biden administration has been very, very uh, intentional about making them the bad actors. And and the problem with the ocean carriers as it relates to U.S. interest is we're, we just don't represent. There aren't significant amount of, uh, you know, none of the top 10 carriers are U.S. US owned. Yeah, yeah. And and because of that, it means that there's there's little political incentive to protect foreign governments who happen to have significant interest, even if they don't directly own the vessel. These are very tightly, uh, uh, you know, the, the businesses are very tightly connected to their governments. And so because of that, I, I can't imagine that there's any political uh, appetite to sort of fight that. It seems like the Republicans, which have more of a protectionist bent and sort of a pro-America bent and a nationalist bent, uh, have a legitimate argument. And then on the other side of the equation, uh, you know, the Democrats have sort of looked at it as a big platform to sort of talk about big business manipulating the, the, and the tanker yeah. business, I mean, the container businesses attacking the U.S. consumer. Um, I think there's a lot of, I don't think this is political grandstanding. I actually think there could be a significant movement towards, um, uh, you know, putting them in, a, subjecting them to antitrust. And look, the Biden administration has been very, very intentional. They've attacked a lot of these mega mergers across our economy in industries where um, it's even less obvious that there is the potential for manipulation. I mean, at the end of the day, container, just like trucking is a, you know, I always say this, this is a commodity and uh, it's a commoditized market. Freight is a commodity. And if someone can control the supply of that, which is does happen, whether we're talking blank selling, slowing ships down, or even potential for collu price collusion, you have an argument that there is a reason that our antitrust rules exist far more than, you know, uh, uh, Microsoft buying a game manufacturer or developer. The, the only, only issue that alleged car freight cartels have been going since 1990s and nothing has been proven yet. So, yeah, that's true. But we do have a different environment where now consumers have sort of dealt with the shocks and you have the geopolitical risk. I mean, you have a you have a defense Department of Defense argument. You have a, you know, a national security issue where in 19 and then in sort of, the, you know, if you go back 30 years ago, the level of power in terms of market share that the non-U.S. companies had was was far less and the concentration was far less. Now we have a very concentrated level of power among these ocean carriers and you know some of those ocean carriers are owned by you know or state-owned entities uh, by you know by china and so you're exposing you're potentially exposing ourselves and you know, the chinese doctrine their military doctrine has said in their own documents that those container vessels in the event of a military conflict will be used for military purposes and so we would be naive to think that the chinese government uh, and the chinese defense department wouldn't use that uh, to their advantage in the event of a military conflict. Cool. Thanks, Craig. So I just kind of want to go, so Craig, give us, a, if you're an investor interested in the transportation market, what should we be looking at or what should we be looking for as, say, an investor? It can't be all terrible, right? <laughs> <laughs> well, look, I think there's a far more exposure. There's going to be a lot of bankruptcies. This is going to be a big year. We've talked about the quote unquote bloodbath of trucking. I think this could be one of the most uh, difficult years in trucking history, simply because of the oversupply. Like I said earlier, 29% more uh, capacity, dispatchable capacities on the roads in the U.S. than what we had in 2018, and volumes are there. If the U.S. economy goes to an official recession, because I think the goods part of the economy is in a recession, but if we uh, declare it as a, we sort of accept it as a recession, or if there's a financial crisis due to bank, so it's sort of a breakdown of the U.S. economy and of the U.S. consumer and unemployment, we could see things get far more worse. And so I think you have to sort of look at a defensive stance and what are those businesses related to freight that are are going to be impacted. So certainly the manufacturers, the OEMs, uh, have risk in this. They have been somewhat uh, insulated from um, some of the issues, very much like the auto manufacturers have in the car. They're the same issues. They didn't have the ability to produce trucks, and therefore their, their, back, their order books are quite high. And there's going to be a lot of consolidation. We're already starting to see that with some big mergers happen. Uh, there's going to be a lot of bankruptcies that happen in the trucking market. Um, I think you know, one of the sort of advantages of all this is that 
U.S. consumers that have seen freight inflation, you still see a lot of big companies talk about they're still experiencing supply chain inflation and freight inflation because what they have, they're looking at is the historical cost. A lot of these freight rates are in annual contracts. And, you know, while they'll play games with the spot market, in trucking specifically, the spot market is, you know, 85 cents cheaper than the contract market uh, is today. And what that means is that there's a massive delta between, you know, to put that in perspective, about 25% cheaper to run into the spot market than it is in the contract market. And what that means is that contract rates are set to go down. They're set to fall and fall significantly over the next year. And what that means for big, big box retailers and manufacturers that have been paying those higher contract rates it means we're about to see those costs come down significantly. So you could see some margin expansion in companies that are buying transportation services because they're going to be the beneficiary of lower freight rates. Uh, and I think that is that's a bullish thing for a, a, you know a lot of the conversation about U.S. consumer slowing and some of the businesses being negatively impacted due, due to that. Um, they are also going to get some advantages because the cost of transportation is going to come down significantly. So if I were, if I were to, you know, speculate on who wins, I would look for those businesses and those commodities and those products where transportation is a large component of their business or the finished good, and understand how much. If we saw a twenty-five or thirty percent savings on transportation expenses, um, what would that mean to the P and L of the business? Excellent. Thank you very much. That's good stuff. You want to any any thoughts on uh, how how Pete Budishag is doing this <laughs> guy head? Mayor Pete, <laughs> uh, you get a McKinsey consultant. Anyone's ever hired McKinsey consultants, and I apologize if anybody's a McKinsey consultant on this call. But anytime you hire a consultant, uh, you you bear the risk that they don't know a whole lot about the topic that they're actually consulting on. You know, I think Mayor Pete thought this was going to be a cush job, and he. Uh, you know, got to play with trains and trucks and airplanes. And, you know, that's every boy's dream when they grow up to be able to do that. I uh, didn't realize that the supply chain is subject to massive disruptions. Um, it always has been, but certainly over the last couple of years. So I don't think he was the right man for the job. I think he thought this was a great sort of political. He could say, hey, I'm, you know, it seems like a really boring job to handle transportation issues. Uh, but um, he was the wrong guy at the wrong time. Uh, and um, has really, I think, I think I would give him an F if I had to give him a grade. Well, thank you. Um, I move to Ed for final thoughts. What should we be really focusing on in this market going forward, looking into, you know, out to the end of the year and into, you know, 24 and 25? What should we particularly be paying attention to? Well, um, I guess from my perspective as an investor and as a speculator, I'm only interested in things that have good supply pictures, if that makes sense, because a lot of the uh, shipping sectors have made so much money recently and they've gone out and ordered so many ships that that's really going to damage their capacity for future earnings. So, you know, if you're an expert and you really follow markets carefully, then fine, you know, go for it with container ships or with LNG carriers. But otherwise, I would say that both of those segments are really dangerous. Um, if we have another panic with respect to Europe sourcing LNG from the US and from further afield uh, ahead of, let's say, the autumn. So, you know, in six months time, that might be the time to look at LNG carriers. But, you know, otherwise, I'd, I would stay away. Uh, I mean, this is not something which will surprise those who follow me on Twitter. I, I try to be as agnostic as I can and share things across sectors, but I clearly have a positive view on some sectors, not on others. Uh, the supply side is looking very positive for dry bulk and for oil tankers, both product and crude. So um, we could very well see more or less a continued bull market in both of those for the next two, three years. Uh, as long as we don't have new supply coming online. And, and that would, you know, even if either sector ordered a bunch of vessels, it would take another 10 years. So I would say that it would be good to uh, keep an eye on those stocks. And when they correct significantly, it's a great opportunity. Uh, at the moment, that is the case with many of the oil taker stocks following the OPEC cut. Um, so that's definitely where my focus is. Dry bulk is similar. I think if you see a deep correction, go for it. But uh, that is assuming that you think that the recession will be, the world recession, I should say, 
will be shallower than all the doomers are saying. And it also assumes that China is going to come back in force and stimulate and need a bunch of commodities because if they don't need iron ore and met coal, then forget it. The market, you know, it doesn't matter if the supply picture is good if you don't have demand showing up. Whereas I think with oil demand, it is kind of a little bit safer from my perspective. I think it's, you know, as, as most of us who follow the markets know, oil demand just tends to grow over time, assuming we don't have some kind of catastrophe. I think that we just lived through a kind of a paralyzing trauma of COVID. And so that is our recency bias to think that it's possible that demand will disappear again. But I think that what's much more likely is that oil demand will just tend to grind higher and with it demand for distillates, jet fuel. You know, when I was looking a few weeks ago and the number of international flights to China is still so low. It's unbelievable. I mean, I, I haven't gone there for work, you know, for years now and I, I miss it. Um, but even if you want to, you can't. I mean, the, the flights are like five grand. And I think they used to have like 50 international flights a day and now there's like 50 per month. So there's a lot of room to grow there. I'm not saying we're going to get back to whatever normal was in 2019. But um, yeah, as long as you're keeping an eye on what's happening with the oil market and with economic growth in general, uh, I think it's a pretty safe bet to say that people are going to need oil to be transported. So that is, I would say my, my strongest recommendation is just to keep an eye on that. Um, and, you know, I share a ton of stuff on my Twitter feed. I try as hard as I can to not get, let my opinion get in the way and get into debates, but just share information and let people make up their own minds. For those who are in finance, but don't follow the sector, the sector, you can do the usual things you do, you know, read transcripts from earning calls, but I, I tend to share a lot of research so you can, you know, that can help give you a kind of a, a taste of, of the supply side. So um, yeah, I would say if you're sanguine about growth and I am, in general, then um, oil is probably the best way of playing that. Excellent, thank you. And Iresh, we'll close with you. What are your final thoughts? What should we be looking for as investors in this market or what should we be keeping our eye out for opportunities in this market going forward over the next say, you know, year to two years to three years? Tracy, as I said, I think Selective container carriers are not bad. Um, you just need to find out um, uh, carriers which has invested in different markets other than ocean shipping. Um, I agree with that. Dry bulk market seems, uh, certain carriers seems to be, um, their forward earnings seems to be good. So you need, just need to find the right entry point. Uh, they dry, most of the analysts I speak to agree that Dry bulk market seems a bit more interesting than the container markets. Uh, I'm not an expert in the tanker market, so I'll leave that. I'll go with what Ed, Ed mentioned. Um, yeah, that's about it. Uh, uh, freight forwarders have done extremely well over the last um, couple of quarters. Um, unfortunately, with the rates rates coming down hard, um, I fear they will have a lot of competition from the, the carriers directly. So... Um, yeah, it's just selecting. If, if you want to be on the container um, fail, then it, you just have to f find the carriers which has a lot of diversified interest. That's it from my side. Excellent. That makes sense. Um, I want to thank all of our speakers today for taking time out of their day. I really appreciate it. I know everybody's super busy. Do follow all three of these people on Twitter. They both, they all three put out so much good information. So I encourage you to follow them all. Uh, follow Place Your Trades to find out what's going on over there. Um, and you can sign up for my market blog on placeyourtrades.com for free. And with that, once again, thank you everyone for today. I really appreciate it. Thank you to all the listeners. And we will see you next Wednesday. Thanks, Tracy.